All right. Well, we may still have a few people join us this morning as we get, get going, but we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. I'm Emily Burns, the program director director with Sky Island Alliance. Um, it's really exciting to see all of you here and to be talking about water. We've certainly had our share of water here in the Sky Island region this summer with a really serious monsoon. Um, it's been very exciting to watch the greening up all around us. And I, I'm sure like, like me, you all are enjoying that as well. I'd like to thank all of our volunteers that have made all of our work at Sky Island Alliance possible possible, especially those of you that have already been helping us study and monitor springs for many years. Thank you to our donors and all of our supporters um, that help make this work possible. I would like to offer a, long, a land acknowledgement to get us going this morning. Uh, Sky Island Alliance, our office is based in Tucson, and this is on the land of the Tohono O'odham and the Pascua Yaqui and other indigenous people. Our work throughout the Sky Island region on both sides of the US-Mexico border takes place on indigenous land. At Sky Island Alliance, we acknowledge the lack of truth and reconciliation with native nations. And our organization is committed to continuing to educate ourselves about this process and mobilizing to stand in solidarity with present day tribes and support indigenous people who are acting to restore their rights and to protect the land we all call home. Springs certainly are incredibly important cultural sites. And that's something we want to think about as we talk about all of our work with studying and working to protect springs um, now and into the future. Uh, in a moment, I'm gonna pass the baton off to Sarah Truby, who is a new staff member here at Skyland Alliance. We're super excited to have her here. She's our habitat conservation manager and is managing our water program, is point on taking all of the fabulous data that comes in from Spring Seeker and helping it tr helping us translate it into conservation and stewardship projects on the ground. Sarah has a PhD in climate science. She's a cave expert. She's worked with Arizona State Parks. She's an absolute asset to Sky Island Alliance. And so please join me in welcoming Sarah. If you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please share them. This is gonna be an interactive presentation. Sarah is gonna do some polls to get to know your thoughts and, and your experience with Springs throughout the presentation. We'll also ask you to chime in a few times in the chat. So get ready to participate, whether you're on Zoom or on Facebook, there'll be opportunities um, to connect with us. So please share your thoughts, but we will ask you to stay muted during the presentation so that Sarah can share all of her great updates today. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you for that introduction, Emily. Hi, everybody. It is such a delight to meet all of you virtually here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. So welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about Seeking Springs and the Bighorn Fire Footprint. That is our major campaign this fall for our Spring Seeker data. But before we really dig into all the information that I wanna share with you today, I'd like to put up a quick poll to learn more about your experience with Spring Seeker. So you should see appearing on your screen right now, a poll. Go ahead and choose one of the answers that you most identify with, whether you are totally new to Springs or you've used to help with adopt a spring. We're just curious about your background uh, in Spring Seeking. Does everybody see that poll? Did that pop up okay? Go ahead and click on whatever answer uh, fits best with you. And if folks are having trouble with the poll, we can, we can uh, skip it and continue. Okay, I'll give it another few seconds if anybody uh, wants to answer that, and then we'll go ahead and continue. It looks like people might be getting some error messages with the poll, so if you can put the um, your answer in the chat, that would be sure. great. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, so tell us more about your Spring Seeking. Have you done it before? Have you used the Spring Seeker app? Uh, have you participated, or are you completely new to Spring Seeking? 
Okay, we've got one person who's done more than 10 um, spring surveys. That's fabulous. Um, one person that's new to spring seeking. All right, that's great. So we already know that we have folks from all types of backgrounds in our audience today. Thank you for joining us. All right, and we even have someone who used to participate in Adopt a Spring. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into some more information about Springs. All right, so today we're going to first talk more about Springs and Spring ecosystems and how um, what Springs are on our landscape. I'm going to talk about wildfires and Springs and some of the potential impacts there, and then I'm going to go into how you can help. On the right side of the image here, you can see a spring in the Catalinas. Uh, you can see some burned trees in the center of that image right there. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that we're going to be looking at throughout the, uh, the presentation today. All right, so first off, I want to ask, what is a spring? So before, um, as we're going to go into a lot of this content, I should say that there's quite a bit of these uh, this information that we've presented in other coffee breaks already. So if you are really, really excited about Springs, a great opportunity is to go back and listen to our Springs 101 presentation um, and any of the other coffee breaks related to Springs. And so um, the link to all of our other coffee breaks uh, should be posted in the chat at some point during this presentation. But for the purposes of this uh, presentation, we're gonna talk about what is a spring. A spring is any place that the groundwater intersects the Earth's surface. So you have water table, you have water under the surface, and at various places, because of rock that the water can no longer flow through or impermeable rock, it ends up coming through at the surface. So on the right side there, you can see a picture of a spring in the Catalina Mountains. Uh, you also see in the center of that photo, there's a backpack. One of the things that we ask our spring seekers to do is put something like a backpack in the picture to make it so that we can tell how big the water source is. Um, so you'll see some of the other photos have things like backpacks in them to, to be able to demonstrate that. Okay, so in terms of where we might find springs, so springs are found throughout the Sky Islands. This map here on the left, uh, you can see this the city streets right here, that's Tucson. The Catalina Mountains are right to the north of that, as well as the Rincons and many of our other mountain ranges throughout the region. So most of our springs are concentrated in the mountain areas in our Sky Islands themselves, um, but they're also along some of the major river valleys, like the San Pedro over here. As far as we know, there's about 4,000 springs on the U.S. side of the border, um, and there's likely more in Mexico. Uh, however, when we, um, if you are already a spring seeker, you know often you head out there and you see a lot more water sources than you think are out there. And, and we're constantly adding new sites. And we're also not the only ones who are adding new spring sites. Uh, we have colleagues in the National Park Service in Saguaro National Park who are also finding new springs each time that they head out. So there's likely more in the US uh, side of the border. And of course, there's a lot more in Mexico as well that we don't know about yet. So there's a number of different types of springs and they're classified by the way in which the water comes up to the surface. So like I said, you have the interaction of water and then various types of rock layers, some of which the water can flow through and some of which the water can't flow through. And when the water reaches a, a rock layer that it can't flow through, it pops out at the surface in a variety of different ways. The most common type of spring that we have are these stream bed springs. And so that's also the professional word for that is called riocrine or the academic word, I should say. A uh, Rio Green Rio Spring um, is a spring that pops up in a stream bed. And so there's some examples of those that you can see uh, shown throughout uh, the Sky Island region here. So one from the Pajaritas on the left side here, um, and then a few from some of our other mountain ranges as well. So these are springs that pop out in a stream bed. This is by far the most common type of spring that we find in our region. So it makes it, if you're out looking for a spring and you're not exactly sure where, checking the stream bed is always a great idea. The second most common type of spring is actually a hill slope spring. So this is where water comes out on a hillside. Uh, and so some examples that you see here, McGrew Spring on the far left actually was slightly enlarged by humans um, to make it so that the water collected there uh, from this hill slope spring. Um, but you can see some other examples from the Chiricahuas and the Catalinas as well here. We also have springs that pop out in meadows, <clears throat> excuse me, or that help form meadows. Um, 
So these are known as helicrine springs. And um, you can see some examples from throughout the Sky Islands as well here. Some of them you may not even have realized were spring-fed ecosystems or groundwater dependent ecosystems as you walked through them. Um, but we do have some of those in our mountains as well. The fourth type of spring that we see in our region, although it is much more common in northern Arizona, is the hanging garden type of spring. And this is where there is a cliff face that water emerges at. And you can actually see these as you drive up the Catalina Highway. Uh, you can see a lot of these, um, the staining from the water in this kind of water emergence or this kind of spring. We have two more types of springs. So one is a pool forming spring. Um, this is an example of one from the Huachucas, and that's just where the water comes out as a pool. Uh, and we also have mound forming springs. So these are where we have mineral deposits that are over time, they build up and build up and they make these mounds. And so you can see in this picture in the bottom right, uh, we actually have these mineral deposits here, um, these carbonate rock deposits that are forming. Um, and over time, those will build up um, over hundreds to thousands of years or even longer in some cases. And then finally, we have springs that emerge in caves. Um, this is a cave that actually has been developed a little bit for, for access. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side where the water emerges in the cave. So like I said, um, the, there's a lot more um, on spring types in our Springs 101 presentation. And so that's something that um, that link will be pasted in the chat and you're welcome to follow up more uh, if you want to learn all about spring types and more about springs in the Sky Islands. But now I'm gonna transition a little bit to ask why are springs important? And so here's where we're gonna to start to get a little bit interactive. So if you could um, open up that chat window and give me one or two words as to why springs are important, why they're important in our region or just in general. And then Emily, hopefully you can read those aloud as folks enter them in the chat. Will do. Water access, habitat for local flora and fauna, refuge for plants and animals. Yeah, a lot of folks thinking about how important these water sources are for, for species in the area. They can indicate the level of groundwater. Water source for critters, absolutely. Yeah, these are all great, thank you. Uh, so the list that we put together uh, includes, like we all said, water, thinking about wildlife moving on the landscape and having to have a place to, to get water as they move through. Springs are also important places for flora and fauna, like, like was mentioned in the chat, that don't live elsewhere because there's not enough water. There also are species that are known only from springs. That's what we call our endemic species. They're found only at spring sites. Springs are also useful for human recreation, for livestock uses, uh, for consumption, that kind of thing. And then someone even mentioned the idea of refugia. And the idea there is that as climate changes, there are some places that are thought uh, if it's dry, it's gonna get drier. Some places will, that are wet will get wetter. Um, of course, this last monsoon aside, um, it does seem like most of the projections are saying that we're gonna get drier here in the Southwest. So the idea of places where groundwater emerges and provides a safe place for wildlife and for plants um, kind of as a refuge against, against climate change. And one thing we do wanna note is though I'm talking about springs throughout this whole presentation and in general, we talk about Spring Seeker to find information about springs. Uh, we're interested in all water in the desert. So if you happen to be out there and you come across some other type of water tank, uh, or other water source, by all means, uh, we want to know about that as well. So I wanna take a little side trip and just look at some fun photos of wildlife that we have from springs because springs are so important for our natural communities. So this is a spring down in the Huachucas and some of you may have seen these photos before, but uh, they're pretty neat, so I decided to share them. Um, so here in the center of the image, you actually see a kawadi that's coming down to this spring to, um, to use the water there. This is a nighttime photo and you can see just kind of above the prickly pear there, there's actually a mountain lion coming in to access the water. 
Here's one of our skunks. We have a number of species here in the Sky Islands. And here's a bear coming into a spring. In general, springs are places where we see a lot of wildlife. Anywhere that we have a wildlife camera to monitor the spring, we see things like ringtails, roadrunners, various species of deer, uh, squirrels and coyotes, all sorts of wildlife come into use springs. And some of the things that we don't capture on camera necessarily, but we do see when we're out there, include a wide variety of bird species, some um, various snake species, another photo of a bear down there on the bottom. Springs are also important for our invertebrate communities. Uh, we have, because we have such unique plants in, um, in our spring areas, we also of course have unique pollinators that come into those plants. There on Facebook, it was mentioned that springs are great uh, for helping with the thermoregulation of a variety of herbs. So since you just showed some pictures of them. Oh yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, of course, um, it can get too hot for some of our uh, reptile friends out there on the landscape sometimes, but spring sites would provide a nice uh, refuge for them as well. So that's a great addition, thank you. Uh, so we also have some unique plants out there. Just a quick note, um, the genus name for Scarlet Monkey Flower has changed and we're working on updating our Spring Seeker app to reflect that. Um, but some of these plants actually indicate that there's water there year round. So even though we have times of year where we don't get rain for months, um, particularly in you know, the, the dry summer like June, uh, we can still see some of these plants at spring sites because they're still getting water. And here are just some more examples of plants, um, including maidenhair ferns are very common at uh, hanging garden type springs. Um, deer grass likes uh, water in general. So we'll see that a lot as well as some of our, our canyon grapes. Okay, so now I'm gonna transition and talk more about the impact of fire on uh, springs and fires in general. So this is a satellite image of the Bighorn Fire from June 18th of 2020. So the fire actually ignited on June 5th. So in less than two weeks, you can see how far the fire extended. And so all the red colors here, um, this is an infrared image, but all those red colors indicate areas that um, are currently burning or have burned. And then the green is of course the, the rest of the, the mountain there. Um, so the Bighorn Fire, if you were in Tucson last summer, you could not have missed it. It just put our mountains alight and it burned for almost two months until the end of July when we finally got a little bit of monsoon rain that helped our firefighters put that out. It ended up burning uh, almost 120,000 acres of mountains. In some cases, the fire had pretty detrimental impacts. Um, some ecosystems are completely uh, evolved to respond to fire and actually some plants require fire to reproduce, um, but some plants don't. Um, and so this is just an image from a spring in the Catalinas after the fire where you can see that there is a lot of burned vegetation um, as a result of that. But like I said, springs and sorry, some ecosystems in general can respond after fire. And this is a picture from this summer um, where you can see in the right side of the image, there's a little bit of burned um, area that you can see. But for the most part, um, this site is, is starting to spring back uh, with some of our, our local plants um, because that water is there to help them. Um, so we actually do have a, an entire coffee break that was focused on the impacts of fire on various ecosystems. And so um, that link will also be pasted in the chat. And you can always, of course, always find it on our Coffee Break website if you want to learn more about the impact of fire on various ecosystems. OK, so get ready to type in the chat again. I have another uh, question for all of you. Um, so here on the right hand side of the image, we have the Catalina Mountains again. Um, you can see kind of the, the northern part of Tucson here in the bottom left of the image. This image actually shows the projected burn severity of the Bighorn Fire. So this is from remotely sensed data, from satellite data, um, as well as some on the ground reports. And anywhere that's red here is where the burn severity was really high, um, all the way grading down through these green colors where it burned, but it wasn't as severe of a burn. And you can see all the blue dots on the map are water sources that we know about in the Catalinas. So um, what are some ideas that y'all have about what are some things that can happen to springs as a result of fire. Go ahead and type those in the chat and Emily can read them aloud. There can be debris clogs. 
that yeah, affect the sure. spring. Yeah, for sure. So debris can can come down from the surrounding landscape or, or plant uh, vegetation can fall over onto the spring. Sure. Erosion can bury the spring. You can get an a, a spring filled with ash. Another comment around the debris. Yeah, so it sounds like actually we have a lot of um, very uh, experienced spring, springs folks here uh, because that's pretty much the list that we came up with. So the idea is that um, the things that can happen to springs include a burial of the spring source. So like I said, the water that comes up in a spring, it flows until it hits an impermeable layer and then it pops out on the surface. But if the whole thing is buried, the water might not be able to flow that way anymore. And so it may not ever emerge again. That might be a permanent change. Um, there can also be erosion or incision of channels. So as the water is moving with a little bit more speed because there's less to hold onto it on the landscape, like less plants to hold onto it, um, it can actually incise channels, which uh, makes it harder in some cases for wildlife to access. Um, some other things include decreased infiltration. So like I said, that water is moving a little bit faster and some other things happen chemically with fires that make it harder for that water to sink into the ground. Um, folks mentioned um, debris and loss of vegetation. So plants can definitely um, be either permanently altered or temporarily um, altered as a result of fire. Um, there can also be changes in biodiversity. So because these sites are so important for various riparian species, as well as some of our endemic species that are found only at springs, um, if that spring site, site is destroyed or damaged um, or the water chemistry changes, uh, that can lead to loss of some of our species. Um, changes in the plants can also change evaporation, can lead to water loss. And then um, folks mentioned debris. Um, and of course, also springs are important cultural sites in many cases. And so it can be, be a loss of those types of sites as well. So just some examples of that. So this is actually a photo from the Chiricahuas after the Horseshoe 2 fire, which burned in 2011 in the Chiricahua Mountains um, near the New Mexico border. Um, and in the center of the photo, you can see a pretty large uh, landslide um, that happened that uh, changed the, the surface of the earth here. Um, it's kind of this, this white area here is where that, that, um, all that earth just kind of slid down. And so that's the kind of thing that you definitely see after fire. Oops, sorry. Um, so some other examples. So on the left side here is Anita Spring in the Chiricahua Mountains. And uh, in this case, there was a loss of vegetation around the spring, but you can still see in the center of the image here that water is available for wildlife or any other uses here. So even though the area burned, uh, the spring was actually um, still available for wildlife there. And on the right side, we have Flicker Spring, which is in the Catalina Mountains. This is an area that burned in 2003 in the Aspen Fire, um, but it didn't burn very severely. And you can see that the spring actually uh, made it through fairly well there, and there haven't been long-term changes to the, uh, the landscape there. And here's an example that we've shared before, which I think is pretty neat. Um, this is a, a Cienega in the Pinaleños, and um, in the background you can see all of the trees that burned, but in the foreground, closer up, closer to the spring site here um, that's in the front of the photo, you can see the conifer trees that actually didn't burn. Um, and that's likely because the, the, the wetter conditions around the spring actually protected some of those trees. And this Justin from the Catalinas last weekend, um, this is from Maverick Spring in the Catalinas. And you can see a, a lot of the burned trees in this area, but then the spring site over here, there's a little spring box you can just barely see right here. Uh, the spring site over here is where all the plants are starting to regrow. So even though we've had a lot of rain, um, we're seeing a little bit of regrowth on the slopes, but really it's these spring sites that um, are kind of the locus of this, this regrowth here. So um, the thing is though, we don't know at these spring sites in the Catalinas, we don't know if they burned really severely. Um, we have a projection from that map that I showed you, but we're not sure. And we're not sure how impacted these ecosystems have been. So here's where we need all of your help. Uh, any of our volunteers are able to help us out um, with our spring seeker. So I know that we have some folks in the audience who are experienced spring seekers, but we also have folks who are completely new. Um, so I'm going to transition now to talk a little bit more about the spring seeker app as a whole and how we actually collect those data. So I'm going to introduce the spring seeker application to all of you. Um, for those of you that haven't done a recent spring survey, we're, we'll talk about the new fire impact questions. Um, we'll talk about planning trips and trip safety. 
um, some ideas for in the field when it comes to navigation and finding springs, and then what's next after this presentation. But before I transition into that nitty gritty, I just want to check with Emily and see if there's any questions that have popped up about spring ecosystems thus far. No questions yet, just some interesting comments about the how the chemistry of soil and water may change after fire. And I think that's something really interesting for us to think about it, and how we could potentially measure that in the future. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. Or to see if we if we do end up doing some restoration, how the chemistry might return back towards more um, pre-fire conditions would be really something interesting to track. Cool. Okay, so let's let's talk about the Spring Seeker application. All right, so Spring Seeker is a, a smartphone application. Um, it is a bilingual tool that we've developed in this product called ArcGIS Survey123. Um, no equipment other than your smartphone is required. Uh, it's easy to do social distancing because unfortunately we are still um, doing that as a result of the pandemic. Um, it takes about 10 minutes, but if you're willing to spend more time, it helps us out to collect more data than that. Um, and so we actually have a detailed uh, we have a very detailed training on Spring Seeker um, that you can access as a part of one of our coffee breaks as well. Uh, and so that link um, will also be posted in the chat and you can find it on our website as well later. Um, and I do want to say that in general, if you have any questions about installing Spring Seeker or using it, I'm here to help. And by any means, just give me a call, shoot me an email, um, whatever works. I'm, I'm always available to help with any of those technological steps that might seem um, a little bit uh, a little bit um, nitpicky or a little bit uh, glitchy, if you will. Okay, so um, we have a detailed user guide that also goes through these various questions. And as I said, the training does as well. Um, but for instance, some examples of some of the questions that are covered include asking what's the name of the water source, if that's known, um, if the water source is wet, ha it has you take some photos um, of the site so that uh, we can um, use those to, to either monitor seasonal changes or to understand the water source as it is right now. Um, this is uh, something that um, I'll, I'll say this again later, um, ArcGIS Survey123 is going to try and make you make a, an account and it's going to try and get you to do all those steps. You don't have to. Um, this is something that you can do without making an account with anybody. Um, it's just a, it's a way for you to be out in the field where the Survey123 application will tell us exactly where you are. And so we can find out where that spring site is that you surveyed. Um, and then all the other information that you provide uh, helps us out. <clears throat> so the new fire impact questions that we've added. So the first one relates to burn severity, the impact on vegetation. Uh, and so you, the question, for instance, talks about within 50 meter of the spring's largest pool, do you see any evidence of understory burn? So that's the low down material, grass and shrubs, um, trees with burned bark. So the trees appear to be alive, but you can tell from their trunks that there's been some burning in the area. Trees with dead leaves and branches due to a fire high up in the crown. So the tree might be dead or it may not be dead. In some cases, trees can come back from that or no recent fire impacts. And then we also ask you to take a photo of the most severely burned area around the spring. And if it's not burned, then just a photo of the vegetation. Um, and I should mention that you see that on this slide, we have uh, an example of the questions in both English and Spanish. Um, we have an entire coffee break in two weeks um, led by one of our fellows, Angel, uh, who will actually present Spring Seeker in Spanish. So if you're more comfortable doing all these questions and doing your surveys in Spanish, um, that'll be a great opportunity to become familiar with that uh, particular tool. And I think that link is also going to be pasted in the chat if it hasn't already, so that folks can register for that. So our next question about burn severity has to do with the area that burned. And I hope you'll forgive my um, very simplistic diagram there of the circle with the cut in quarters. Um, so the way that we would like you to assess burn severity is to look at within 50 meter of the spring's largest pool, do you see no observable damage or a quarter, a half, three quarters, or all of the area was burned. So the way that I do this is I stand up with my arms in a 90 degree angle and I say, okay, this, this quarter doesn't look burned. And then I turn 90 degrees and I see whether or not that quarter looks burned. And you kind of progress through like that uh, to figure out if it's a quarter, a half, or three quarters, or all of the area was burned. 
We also, as we talked about, one of the biggest risks for springs after fire is the risk of burial. So we have a couple of questions about the spring position, which helps us understand how risky it is to uh, potentially be buried. Um, so in this case, we're asking where is the largest spring pool relative to the surrounding stream environment? So is it at the bottom of the stream channel? So like we said, that's the most common type of spring that we find, but that's not always what you'll find out there in the field. Is it on the side of the stream channel, at the top, or not in a stream channel? So here we have another uh, simplistic diagram. Here's an example of a spring that's at the bottom of the stream channel. If you kind of picture you're in the stream right now, and this is kind of a cross-section view um, where you're looking um, either down or upstream. If you're standing in the bottom of this bowl, then you're at the bottom of the spring channel or of the stream channel. Um, if you're on the side of the slope, then you're at the side. If you're at the top of a bowl, then um, you put at the top of the stream channel. And then if you're in some other kind of environment with flat ground, then, um, then you'd say not in a stream channel. Um, so of course, this helps us assess the risk of whether or not the spring will be buried or could be buried. And then related to that, um, the question, the last question that we have related to, or the last new question that we have related to fire impacts, um, spring position is as far as you can see above the spring, do you see dead or missing vegetation? And of course, vegetation is important because it holds on to the soil and rock. Exposed soil or loose rocks that look unstable, a steep slope gradient or no steep slope, uh, and um, either because it's flat ground or vegetated and stable. And you can select more than one of these um, if more than one is appropriate. Um, and that will help us understand whether or not the slopes will be uh, potentially be buried. Okay. One thing, if you're already a spring seeker to keep in mind is that you uh, should log in to survey one, two, three before you lose cell phone coverage because we have updated the survey recently. So you'll see, uh, you'll see a screen like this when you open survey one, two, three, uh, click on continue without signing in. Um, it'll show at the very top of the screen up here in kind of small letters. It says updates available one. So you click on that, click on Spring Seeker, and then it will download the update for you. Um, and this is important to do before you lose cell phone coverage. Um, but uh, if you already have Survey123, please remember to do that. Now is a great opportunity to do it or at the end of this presentation. Um, just a really good uh, thing to remember to do before you leave. And then if you're new to spring seeking, of course, all of these steps have to be done before you leave the field or leave for the field um, for the first time because it's important to do it when you have Wi-Fi or cell phone service. All right, so next we're gonna talk a little bit about planning a trip. You have a couple of different options. You're welcome to come out with Sky Island staff. We have a couple of day trips available um, in September and I'm going to soon be sending out information about dates in October. Um, we're going to give preference to those who haven't been out with us, but I'm new, so I haven't been out with any of you, and I would love to go out uh, to the field with anyone who wants to head out with us. Um, definitely talk to me about your preferences when it comes to hiking or two-wheel or four-wheel drive, if you have any particular area, area you want to visit, that kind of thing. The other option is to go out independently. Uh, we don't recommend that you go completely by yourself, but um, if you have a household group or a friend group that you feel um, safe with, by all means, um, please feel free to head out with that group. Um, we can also help set up uh, matching up with another volunteer with similar interests and uh, preferences when it comes to hiking. Um, we still ask you to coordinate and check in with us just so that we can keep an eye on which springs have been visited and which ones will still be visited. Um, and of course, if you're going out in a group that isn't your family group, um, it's always a good reminder to discuss COVID-19 safety with, with that group. So when you're actually excited about heading out there and you really want to go out and you want to seek a spring, the first thing you have to do is figure out what spring you want to look at. And this is something I can also help with. If you have no preference or no idea, um, let's have a conversation and we can find a good site for, for you to go to. Um, so one thing we one tool that we have to do this is the Spring Seeker Waters map. So the way you access that is you go to our website, scottislandalliance.org, and you um, go down to this, this item right here. Um, the first, the rest of the website right now walks you through how to install the application on your phone and how to um, get Spring Seeker into Survey123 on your phone. Um, but then step four is to look at this map to start to look at some of the springs that are available to look at. So when you open that, the map will look like this. Um, the, the bright colors in the background here are landowners. 
Uh, we'll primarily be working on Coronado National Forest land, so that's this green land right here. Uh, and all the spring sites are in various shades of blue on this map. Um, red are the ones that we've done recently, and we have data from uh, since the Bighorn Fire burned, we have those. But all of the green sites are ones that we don't have data from yet um, in terms of fire severity. So here's a good opportunity if you say, you know, I'm going to be over here um, in the um, on the north side of the Catalinas, and maybe while I'm there, I'll bop in and I'll survey some of these sites down here. Um, that's the way that you can kind of use this map to see what's been done and to pick some of those sites. We also are developing a trip list. Uh, so this can be accessed, um, and I'll send this all out after or through email afterwards. Um, but this trip list looks just a basic spreadsheet um, where it has the site name or the water source name um, and then the location and then some details about the trip. So it tells you how much distance um, the hike might be, whether or not you need four wheel drive. And then there's also some details about the um, how to access the spring itself. Um, and so you can read those descriptions and say, oh, that one sounds really fun. Let's do that. Um, and then what we ask you to do is to put your name over here in one of these turquoise columns, put your email address down, um, put a projected date that you are planning to go out there. And then if you do need uh, or would like a volunteer, another volunteer to match with you, go ahead and write yes um, in that column. And then we can uh, find another volunteer um, to partner up with you to go out spring seeking. So like I said, fill out the turquoise columns and then um, let me know what spring interests you. I'll be checking this spreadsheet regularly, um, but if you are really excited to get going, shoot me an email um, about what trip you want to do and when you want to go. Um, we need to get permission because some of these areas are still closed. Um, so that's why it's important to let me know kind of your planned trip dates um, and where you're, uh, where you're intending to go. Okay, some safety considerations to keep in mind. Um, we do have all volunteers sign a waiver. This is a clip from our website again. And, and um, under Get Involved, you can go down to become an SIA volunteer and you can sign our volunteer waiver there. Um, if you've already done this, uh, you don't have to do it again. Or if you don't remember if you've done it, let us know and we can check that um, and we can make sure that you're all squared away there. We also have some other paperwork that we have to fill out now um, because we'll be working on federal lands and I'll, we'll make sure once again, um, stay in touch with me and we'll make sure that you have all that information. There's also a great opportunity on our website under Spring Seeker over here. Um, you can also read about Spring Seeker safety um, and that is an excellent uh, document that goes through kind of all the concerns about heading out into the field to collect data, everything from mosquitoes to weather to uh, what to wear, uh, or at least some recommendations for that um, as you head out into the field. And then specifically for springs in the Catalinas. So some of our springs are at pretty high elevations. Um, so if you're not used to working at elevation, keep that in mind. You may have to move a little bit slower, a little bit differently um, than working down in the Tucson Basin. Um, the weather in the Catalinas can be hot or it can be cold or it can be sunny or it can be raining with lightning and it can change in moments. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, some sites may require four wheel drive or at least high clearance vehicles. Uh, the control road, as far as we know, is currently closed. Um, but when that opens up again, that's going to be a good way to access some of the sites on the backside of Mount Lemmon. Uh, many of our sites are on trail, um, but others require bushwhacking. And so if you prefer to hike on trail, there are many options for you there. Uh, if you would prefer to go bushwhacking, that's definitely something else that can be done. Um, there's everything from half day to overnight options for our spring trips. And the key thing to know about now visiting springs in the Catalinas is that they're likely in extremely steep terrain with some unstable slopes, some downed and burned trees, like you can see in this photograph on the right side. Um, and by no means do we want anyone to be so committed to going out to seeing a spring that they uh, end up risking themselves. So if you get, even if you get 10 feet outside of the car and all of a sudden you say, you know what, this just doesn't feel right to me. The slope feels too steep. This is, this is too much bushwhacking for me. Please just turn around. Um, don't worry about collecting the data. Um, I will not be disappointed whatsoever if you come back and you say, hey, I didn't get to the spring. Like, I will thank you for doing that. Um, so by all means, please be careful uh, moving in these landscapes right now. So some other ideas when you're out in the field. Uh, so these are some things that um, you can use, some tools you can use to help find springs. So what we do 
um, once we've squared away all of our details about trip planning and trip safety, um, we'll talk, we'll, hand, I'll, we'll take the GPS point and we'll say, okay, here's where we think the spring is. So to get there, there's a couple of different tools you can use. Um, if you haven't done a lot of backcountry or navigation in general, um, there are orienteering classes. Um, I just YouTube search these right now, but um, there are many out there. I can't speak to the, the quality of many of these, but that's definitely an opportunity if you uh, want to gain some of those skills. There's also so many different applications now you can put on your phone. Um, my favorite is this one, Gaia GPS. And then I also use Topo Max because that has all of the old um, USGS or United States Geological Survey topographic maps on it. Um, those are my two favorites, but uh, everyone has different preferences. And by all means, um, if this is something you haven't done a lot of before, uh, let's sit down and talk about it. And let's talk through the different options for navigating to your spring. Um, paper maps are also always an option. Um, I like the green trails map. Usually you can get it at Summit Hut here in Tucson, um, but there's other options out there as well uh, to actually print up um, or to be able to look at uh, a really good accurate trail map of the Catalinas um, in this particular project. Um, if you prefer the, the topographic maps, um, you can actually print them for free from the National Geographic website. Um, so that's kind of neat too. Um, and this is, this is something that, um, a resource that I'll share with everybody uh, over email if you um, reach out to continue to be a spring seeker. And then one last thing kind of about navigation, um, it's really helpful to us if you record your hours and your mileage as you're navigating out to a spring, because um, we use this for grants. So um, if you have any questions about that, you can let me know as well. All right, so in terms of actually finding springs, let's say you have that GPS point, you're navigating to it, you've moved out there to the field, you're super safe and you haven't had any issues accessing the spring site, but you get there and it looks like there's nothing at the point. So the last thing we're going to do is talk about some tips to be able to identify springs in the field, uh, and then um, we can uh, we can go from there. But before I start sharing some tips, I'm curious to ask all of you, what are some things that you've done? Um, those of you that have springs uh, spring seeked before, what are some things that you've done if you've gotten to a GPS point and you haven't seen the spring there? So go ahead and type those in the chat and Emily can uh, read those again. Look for increased vegetation, which is noted doesn't work so well right now. It's been really green. <laughs> Lots of green. For sure. Yeah, everything is so green. It's really hard to tell what's different. <laughs> Any other thoughts? A riparian vegetation. Nice. Yeah. So um, some of the, the hints that we've come up with. So vegetation changes is the easiest one for sure. Uh, so um, finding springs to look for those changes in vegetation, you can see some of the greener areas here in the drainages. Um, so like I mentioned before, most of our springs are found in those, those stream bottoms. Um, so that's the first clue to look there and then look for these vegetation changes. And if everything's green, that's a little bit harder. Uh, and instead you have to think more about the actual species that you're looking at. So here we have some walnut and some seep willow, um, some plants that require a little bit more water. And then on the right image here, we have some cottonwoods. So if everything's green, sometimes it comes down to what type of green is it uh, to help um, identify some of those, those spring locations. Other things you can look for include stains of water or mineral stains on the rock. That's some evidence that there's some water flowing there. Uh, pretty regularly or places that water has carved out the rock as well. And then it's also really helpful to look for human influence or development uh, because humans have been accessing spring sites for a while and putting in things like troughs and tanks and piping. Um, it can be helpful if you find some of this to follow the piping uphill, you might find the spring source that way. Um, but even if you get out there and you find some water and you're not sure if it's a spring, um, that's okay. We still want to know about it. So if you, if you're like, okay, I'm at the GPS point, I've looked around for vegetation, I've looked around for tanks and piping and, and all this, but I just can't seem to find any of that. Um, but there's some water here, go ahead and fill out the survey for that. And that would be, that will be great for us. That's super helpful. Okay, so what's happening next after this presentation? Um, I'll email anyone who attended uh, to get some follow-up information out to all of you. Um, please take this opportunity to read about safety 
and sign our waiver if you haven't done that. Um, and I, like I said, I also send out that paperwork that Coronado National Forest is asking us to do. Um, look over that Google document and I'll send a link to that as well. Um, or pick a trip on that or ask us um, what trip you, uh, to join us on. Um, we'd be very happy to go out to the field with you. Um, basically, just get in touch with me and be sure to check in and out with me when you head out. Um, that's something that's important to keep track of um, just to make sure for safety reasons that uh, I know where you're going and, and then I can also track which springs we're actually seeking. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us and transition to see if there are any questions. Awesome, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, we do have a question that came up a little bit earlier when you were going over the fire impact questions that have been added to the Spring Seeker Survey. Could you describe in a little more detail what a slope would look like if it was to appear unstable? What, what would that look like? Sure, yeah, so some of the things that we look for for unstable slopes, um, actually this photo that I put here in the background is um, probably helpful for that. Um, so on the right side of the image here, we have a slope where there's a lot of exposed soil and there's not a lot of plants holding onto it. Um, there's also a lot of downed trees and vegetation. And so um, that means there's, if there is a big rain event, um, that there's nothing to hold that soil and that material there. Um, and so it might slide down into the drainage. Um, contrast that with if you were at a spring and all you see on both sides of the stream uh, are bedrock. So you just see rock, like either cliffs or you see, you know, rolling um, large, uh, large rock, um, then that is much, it's a different type of stability, but it's much more stable than something that looks like this that could just kind of wash off away um, into the, into the stream bottom. Um, but it, maybe Emily, if you have other thoughts on that, you're welcome to. Oh, I think that's great. Um, there's also some questions about what is the Survey123 app and how's, what's the first step to download the app? Um, and I'm just gonna type into the chat a link to our Spring Seeker webpage that does walk through this step-by-step. -step. Awesome, yes, thanks, Emily. So yeah, um, Survey123, um, you can click on all the links and when Emily's gonna put the, the link in there, it walks you through step one, two, three, how to install that on your phone, um, how to navigate to our survey within Survey123. Um, and we are totally happy uh, also to, um, I can jump on the phone with anybody and we can walk through it as well if that's helpful. Um, we do also have a training that's a step-by-step -step on this. Um, it's not a live training, it's recorded, but that also might be helpful um, for folks who are interested in that. Any other questions? Not yet, but just compliments on a great presentation. Well, thank you. It's it's delightful to meet everybody, and I'm so excited to meet you all either in person or virtually and um, head out into the field with you for sure. But yeah, I'm happy. Um, I want to be respectful of people's time. If you have to jump off, by all means, but also um, I can uh, stick around for a little while and answer any more questions that pop up. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of your week. There's a question about uh, the potential for super alkaline debris flows. Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I don't, uh, this is going to be supposition, not um, truly informed um, literature research answer to that. Uh, but in general, um, you can get some pretty interesting water chemistry changes um, with if you do have something like a, you know, a bunch of ash or something else that's ending up in the spring. Um, and particularly for some of our endemic species that are found only at springs, they have a, um, a narrower range of conditions that they can survive in. Um, so one of the potential impacts uh, could be that it changes the water chemistry so much that those species can't survive there anymore. Um, but I'd have to do some more research to give a real, real answer to that question. There's an, another question about whether we're still offering the Adoptive Spring program, and I'm, I'm happy to tackle that one if you'd like. Sure, go ahead. Uh, 
Adopt a Spring is something that we used a slightly different methodology, used some equipment in the field, um, and has been really effective for us to study change at spring sites over time. So for groups that are connected to an adopt a spring site and still have access to the equipment, we're happy to have those methods continue to be used in those places. We're also now encouraging people more to use the Spring Seeker app and to visit spring seasonally and collect the same data as you would for a single spring visit. Um, and that's gonna allow us to measure change. If you're interested in, a, you know, quote unquote, adopting one of those spring seeker sites, um, please be in touch with us. We're really thoughtful about where we want to do that type of monitoring. We create often new trails and do have a little bit of impact every time we go to a spring. So we just wanna um, think through with you what would be the best places to have that kind of repeat measurement done, but we're definitely interested in that. And some of these sites that Sarah has been talking about in the Bighorn Fire perimeter, we're going to need to keep a watch on them. Right now, they may not have immediate um, spring threats from the erosion or from fire, but we definitely know that as time goes on and more of the vegetation um, decomposes, the risk could go up. So get in touch with us, please, if you're, if you're interested in being one of those seasonal spring seeker um, volunteers. And uh, one piece that we didn't, um, I didn't touch base on here is that we are using these data to hopefully um, do some restoration projects in the Bighorn Fire footprint. And so uh, if we do a if we do one of those stewardship projects, it would be very helpful to have folks who were interested in potentially um, visiting those sites numerous times over the span of a few years to give us some additional data on the effectiveness of those restoration measures. Yeah, definitely. And there's a question about whether we still want Spring Seeker done in other areas beyond the Catalinas. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, please. No. So um, this is just uh, we're doing a fall campaign here because we're applying for some funding to do some restoration projects in the Catalinas. Um, so that's kind of why we are uh, presenting on this right now. Um, but please, if you are closer to another Sky Island and you would rather do spring surveys there or you just want to go somewhere different, um, by all means, that is absolutely still an option. And um, you're welcome to uh, you know, use the Spring Seeker Waters map to select a site or to talk to me about it. Or if you have a site in mind, um, all of those things, we are super still supportive of getting data from everywhere right now. Yeah, and I would just just to add that uh, our our additional priority are water sources that are close to the border. Um, we've been studying wildlife and the wildlife community in the Patagonia and Wachuca Mountains, the San Rafael Valley, and we're really working with the Forest Service right now to understand where water sources there could be improved, the habitat condition could be improved, access to wildlife, maybe even exclusion of cattle could happen to promote the resilience of those springs. So that's a second priority. And if you're interested in venturing down towards the border, we recognize those water sources are incredibly important for, especially for species that are migrating between the US and Mexico. And of Any course, questions? we're gonna be asking folks, um, if you're in Mexico, if you're in Sonora, definitely encouraging folks to be getting out. And that's gonna be the focus of our Spring Seeker presentation in Spanish coming up on September 9th. We have um, so many great questions that we would love your help answering in Sonora about the distribution of springs and their condition. Okay, there's another question about, does our data get shared with the Spring Stewardship Institute in Flagstaff? Yes, and uh, one of the um, goals, so I, I just started about a month ago, but one of my goals is to make sure that in particular we are updating the locations, the new locations that we discover are springs, because that's something that the Springs Online database um, at the Springs Stewardship Institute is interested in. Um, other than that, um, we are able to share all of our data and upload it into their database. And um, that's something that we're hoping to continue to do as we move forward. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. So that looks like the end of the questions at this point. Um, so thanks for a great presentation, Sarah. Thanks for jumping right into all of this and uh, looking forward to uh, just getting everybody out there 
in the Sky Islands looking for water. It's so exciting to, to look for the water source and actually find it and see what plants are there, what insects are there, the evidence of the wildlife in the region. So we hope you'll have fun doing that and please be in touch if you have any questions. Okay, with that, thank you all. Thank Goodbye. You.